I want to share a couple of scriptures with you in Acts chapter 12. Look what it says. Verse 5 says, Peter therefore was kept in prison. Keep in mind he's in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Then the next verse in Timothy says, I exhort therefore that, this is the foundation, folks, of what I'm going to preach for three or four weeks. That text jumped out at me. It jumped out at me. I'd never noticed it before. But that text jumped out. It says, listen, first of all, not second of all, not third of all, not last of all, but first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So what does that simply say? It says, pray first. Get this, folks. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and 1, the very first verse I ever memorized, I memorized and I learned. We didn't go to church. As many of you know, I didn't grow up in church. But I went to a public school. And we started every morning with Bible reading. Every morning with Bible reading. I think it'd be good if we could get back to that, by the way. And we would do scripture memorization. And the first verse I ever memorized was Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God. Now get this. He didn't put that in the book of Malachi. He didn't put that in the book of Revelation, the 66th book. He started out by saying, in the beginning, God. You know what we need to do, folks? In the beginning, God. We need to make sure God's a part of the beginning. Amen? In the beginning, God. Wherever we start, in the beginning, God. Let's pray. As I bow my head in your presence, Lord, God, would you help us as we talk about pray first. <laughs> Have your will and way, and for all you do, we're going to praise you. For I pray this prayer with a grateful heart. For I pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about pray first. I read one time about a church that was really struggling. They were struggling. They had no people who came. Their, their finances weren't good. The church was just greatly, greatly struggling. They tried some programs. They were all a flop, and people were just leaving the church and leaving the church. And finally, the pastor did something. He called a meeting with his deacons, and he said to his deacons, I've called this meeting so we can pray. Our church is not going well, so I've called this special meeting with the leaders just so we could pray. And one of the deacons spoke up and he said these words. He said, my God, has it come to that? My God, has it come to that? And when I read that story, I thought many times that's our lives. Prayer is our last resort. But prayer ought to be, ladies and gentlemen, our first response. Many times it's our last resort but it ought to be our first response. You say, well, pastor, I, I, I'm going to do something. Well, shouldn't you pray first? Pastor, I'm going to buy something. Shouldn't you pray first? Pastor, I'm going to give somebody a piece of my mind. Shouldn't you pray first? Pastor, I'm going to take this job. Shouldn't you pray first? Pastor, I'm not going to take this job. Shouldn't you pray first? Pastor, I'm going to make this decision with my child's education. Shouldn't you pray first? All I'm trying to do in this series of messages is before we do anything else, ladies and gentlemen, let's pray first. Let's simply pray first. When I read 1 Timothy 2 and 1, it just jumped out at me. It said, I exhort therefore that first of all, first of all, and then he mentioned the words supplication. What is supplication, Pastor? Supplication is an intense personal need. Uh, supplications are intense 
personal needs. And he said, when you have those, first of all, supplications. And then he used the word prayer. What is prayer, folks? Prayer is the sincere desire of your heart. Prayer is not how loud you get or how soft you pray. Prayer is the sincere desire of your heart. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And then there's intercession. That's praying on the behalf of someone else. That's interceding for other people. And then the fourth thing he said was giving thanks. Well, what is that? That's simply expressing gratitude to God. But what I want you to see more than anything else, first of all, pray first. Before you do anything else, I want to exhort you. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to pray first. Now, I want to make three statements that are my key statements. Statement number one is this. God is looking. God is looking. Let me give you the background to this story. This story primarily deals with King Herod. King Herod, we're reading about in Acts chapter 5. But let me tell you what he did. He had John the Baptist beheaded. John the Baptist was beheaded. Jesus Christ was crucified. He killed James with a sword. And then the Bible said he, he knew it pleased the people to have John the Baptist beheaded. He knew it pleased the people to crucify Christ. He knew it pleased the people to kill James with a sword. And then the Bible says he put Peter in prison. Now get this. Peter is in prison. It looks like all hope is gone in light of the fact that Christ was crucified. John was beheaded. James was killed with a sword. But here's what I want you to see. God is looking. When it seems like all hope is gone, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to remind you that God is watching. When it seems like you... Pastor, nothing's going well. I want you to know God is looking. I want you to know that God is looking after you when it seems like he's not. I heard about a Catholic school, and the nuns had a picnic. And they had a picnic, and they had this big, long table. And on one end of the table, they had delicious apples. And they had a sign in front of these delicious apples. This is what it said. Take only one apple, children. God is watching. But on the other end of the table, they had delicious cookies. Delicious cookies. Just a big pile of cookies. And a little boy <laughs> took a sign. And he wrote on that sign, <laughs> Take all the cookies you want because God is watching the apples. What he didn't know is Proverbs 15 and 3 tells us that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. What he didn't know is 2 Chronicles 16 and 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. He didn't know that Matthew 10 and 29 says, when a sparrow falls to the ground, ladies and gentlemen, God sees it. And if a sparrow fall into the ground, God sees. He sees what you're going through. I just want to remind you this morning, no matter what you're going through, God is looking. Peter was in prison. It seemed like all hope was gone. God miraculously delivered him. But Peter never got over the fact that when I was going through the hardest time of my life, God was looking. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Look what he penned in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3 and 12, years after this incident, he penned, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them. 
that do evil. You say, Pastor, I'm going through a tough time. What would you say to me? God is looking. But let me tell you something else. Not only is God looking, but God is listening. God is listening. If we look at verse 6 and 7, Peter was miraculously delivered out of prison. Peter was miraculously delivered out of prison because the church prayed without ceasing. Now, you hear me on this point. We hear all this talk today about the church has got to have influence. And I know we do. But I want you to understand something. The early church didn't have enough influence. They didn't have enough social power to keep Peter out of prison. But they had enough power to pray him out of prison. They didn't have enough influence to keep him out of prison. But they had enough influence with God to pray him out of prison. So what we got to understand, the most important weapon we have is prayer. You said, Pastor, what, what is your objective in what you're preaching for the next three or four weeks? I, I really want to teach people about prayer and fasting. I, I really do. You said, well, Pastor, I, 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 I got to be transparent with you. I, I don't really know how to pray. Well, folks, did you realize, do you realize this? If you really don't know how to pray, you're in good company. You say, what do you mean? Well, in Romans 8, verse 26, the greatest Christian who ever lived other than, the, other than Christ was the apostle Paul. And he said, we don't know how to pray as we ought. I mean, the greatest Christian who ever lived said, we don't know how to pray as we ought. You say, well, pastor, I need some help concerning prayer. Apparently, Paul did too. And then look, the disciples, they traveled with Jesus for three years. They walked with him. They had meals with him. They woke up together. They, 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 they did ministry together. And in Luke 11 and 1, you know what's amazing? They never said, teach us how to preach. They never said, Lord, will you teach us how to exegete a scripture? They never said, Lord, will you, will you teach us how to lead people to sing? They said, no, no. Lord, we got, I know we've been with you three years, and I know we've been with you every moment of every day, but God, we don't know how to pray. And would you be so kind, Lord? Would you just teach us how to pray? Because we really need to learn how to pray. Here's what I want to say to you. God is looking, but God is listening. I want to make three quick statements. Statement number one is this. God hears simple prayers. God hears simple prayers. The Bible says in Matthew 6 and 7, get this. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. When I was a young Christian, I was in a conference. And I was talking to this guy. And he sounded normal. He sounded just like a normal guy. But in a few moments later, they said he's coming to the pulpit to open our service with prayer. And something magically happened. His voice changed. I don't understand why your voice would magically change because you get behind a pulpit. See, the Bible says this. The Bible says in Matthew 7 and 11, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good things to them that ask him? See, it was a great day when I realized, folks, we can pray simple prayers because he's our Father. And when this guy came up to the pulpit to pray, I heard him say these words. He said, Oh, thou great potentate, sitting yonder in the heavens, Upon whose throne angels cast their golden crowns and cry, Holy, holy, holy. And then he said, We beseech thee with petitions of acquisitions. 
And I thought, nobody talks to their daddy like that. Because God's not an Englishman, by the way. Amen? Can you imagine, can you imagine one day, uh, Savannah Abigail was about this high, and, and, and I walk into the house, and she says, Oh, thou great pastor. <laughs> Coming in from sermon preparation, we beseech thee, can we go get a pizza? <laughs> no, here's what would happen. I promise, because this actually happened. She'd be about that high, and I'd come in. She'd say, Daddy. I'd say, yes, I'm at Abigail. She'd say, we go get pizza. And I'd say, did your mama put you up to that? And she'd say, yes, she did. You know what I know? God hears simple prayers. Talk to him like your best friend because he is. Talk to him like your best friend because he is. I'll tell you something else. God hears short prayers. God hears short prayers. You say, Pastor, can you, can you back that up? Oh, yeah. Peter in Matthew chapter 14, verses 30 and 31, uh, he was drowning. <laughs> And he said this, Lord, save me. And God reached out his hand and saved him. That tells me God hears short prayers. That tells me that God hears short prayers. That, that, that tells me in Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43, there was a thief on the cross, and he, he prayed a pretty short prayer. He said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know what that tells me, ladies and gentlemen? That tells me, get this, that tells me that God hears simple prayers. I'll tell you, I'm enjoying this more than you are. That tells me that God hears short prayers. But let me tell you something else. It tells me that God hears sustained prayers. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about, sustained prayers? 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? It means Praying repeatedly and often. Praying repeatedly and often. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth said these words. He said, I never prayed longer than 20 minutes. But I never went 20 minutes without prayer. D.L. Moody said, I never prayed long prayers. But D.L. Moody said, I never went long without prayer. Daniel said in Daniel 6 and 10, he said, three times a day, three times a day, three times a day I'm going to pray. Look, look folks, I, I, I just want to teach you. You're on the phone with somebody and you hang up. As you hang up, let it just be a reminder. God help that person. I don't know what they're going through. But Lord, would you help them? Uh, you're at school and that bell rings several times a day. You hear that bell ring? Let that bell be a reminder to pray for your friends. Let that bell be a reminder to pray for people that you interact with. Hey, hey, you're a housewife or a house husband, and you're folding clothes at home, and you're folding Johnny's pants. That'd be a good reminder to pray for Johnny. That'd be a good reminder. That's, ladies and gentlemen, what pray without ceasing is. It's not finding always being in sackcloth and ashes. It's just wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you're getting ready for a meeting. God help me in this meeting. God direct me in this meeting. God guide me in this meeting. That is what praying without ceasing is. You say, no, wait, 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 Pastor. Pastor, uh, sometimes when I pray, it don't seem like he answers. Get this, he does. I, I, I want you to say, Pastor, it don't seem like he answers. I promise you he does. But see, he answers in one of four ways. Sometimes he answers directly. You say, what do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. Literally, it no more than comes out of your lips, according to Isaiah 65, verse 24. It no more comes out of your heart then God answers and it's done. I mean, literally, Peter said, Lord, save me. Bam. Sometimes the answer's direct. But let me tell you something. Sometimes the answer's delayed. 
Sometimes God wants to answer, but the timing is just not right. See, the only thing, the only difference between salad and garbage is timing. Amen? And sometimes the, sa- the, the, the timing is just not right. So you get this, folks. Sometimes when you pray, it's direct. Sometimes it's delayed. But get this, folks. Sometimes it's different. What are you, what are you talking about? Well, God's going to answer. But God's got a different answer, and it's a better answer. Can you prove that by the Bible? Well, I most certainly can. You remember Mary and Martha said to Jesus, they said when the brother died, he got there after about four days. And they said, Jesus, get real. If you'd been here, our brother Lazarus wouldn't have died. You could have touched him and healed him. And here's what I'd like to say to them. Girls, y'all, didn't, y'all don't understand. You wanted a healing but Jesus wanted to do a resurrection. <laughs> you, you say, well, Pastor, why didn't that relationship work out? I'll tell you why. Because God had something better in mind. Why didn't that job work out? Because God had something better in mind. Why did it work out the way? Oh, that's reason enough to just put our hands together and be happy clappy. Amen. And let me tell you something. I'm so enjoying preaching if this is any indicator of the year. Look here. There's a fourth way that God answers, and that is denied. You say, what what do you mean? Well, let me explain something to you. No is an answer too. Sometimes God simply says no. Ruth Graham, the wife of the great preacher Billy Graham, said these words. I'm glad that God doesn't answer every prayer the way I wanted it. Because she said if he did, I would have married the wrong man three times. Amen. Amen. All I'm saying, folks, sometimes God simply says no. Now get this. God is looking. God is listening. But I want you to understand one other thing. God is leading. God is leading. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? I mean, when you're praying and it seems like nothing's happening, I want you to understand something. God is working. In Acts chapter 12, look what verse 7 says. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. Look. And miraculously, there was a light that shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly. Wait. And the chains fell off his hands. Goodness gracious. Why? Because the church was praying. Look. And the angel said, Peter, gird yourself. Put on your sandals. And he said to them, put on your sandals and put your garment on. Now wait. Get this, folks. A light shined from heaven. Get this. The chains miraculously fell off. But he said to Peter, Put your shoes on, boy. Put your coat on. You know what that tells me? We're labors together with God. God's got a part and you've got a part. And without God, we cannot. But without us, he will not. We, we've got a part. Like, folks, some of you say, well, I want God to do something. But you might need to put your sandals on. You might need to put your coat on. I need God to do something, but oh, this is good preaching. Better than you're responding. You've got a part. Now wait, look what verse 10 says. And when they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street. And forthwith the angel departed with him. Get this. They came to an iron gate. And God opened the iron gate. And I'll tell you what I know about every person that's listening to me today. Everybody that's listening to me feels like you have an iron gate in your life. Pastor, I've got an iron gate. And I just can't open. I know you can't. And I can't either, folks. But God can. 
and God does nothing but by prayer. I read this scripture this week. It was about Ezra. Ezra was an Old Testament leader. And the people were turning back to pagan gods. And in Ezra chapter 9, verse 3, I don't know if you've ever been here, but get this. And I'm almost done. I'm not, well, it's a little while. But anyway, in Ezra chapter 9, verse 3, he said, I've got to the point. I just wanted to pull my hair out. Did you ever do that, folks? Boy, it's hard to have a home like heaven if you're raising the child from hell. Amen? You just want to pull your hair out. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Problems. Pro hey, 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 you got a problem. Sure. You, you get there where you just want to want to pull your hair out. And then Ezra got there. He said, I just want to pull my hair out. But look what he did in verse 5. In verse 5 it says, And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, having rent my garment and my mantle. Look. And I fell on my knees. Pastor, what do you need to do when you feel like you want to pull your hair out? Fall on your knees. And look. When he wanted to pull his hair out, but he didn't pull his hair out. He fell on his knees in Ezra 10 and 1. The people turned back to God. Literally, while he was praying, they came and repented. Instead of pulling his hair out, ladies and gentlemen, he fell on his knees and the people came back to God. What does that tell you? Folks, when it seems like God's not working, God is working. When it seems like God's not leading, God is leading. What, what do you recommend we do, Pastor? We just realize that God is looking. We just realize that God is listening. We just realize that God is leading. God is working. Let me tell you one story and I'm done. David Livingston was a missionary to Africa. He was actually a missionary to Assam, Africa. There's where the headhunters were. He always wanted to take the gospel where nobody had taken the gospel. And he was trying to take the gospel to native tribes. True story. And he said one night, a man came to him and said, just before dawn, missionary Livingston, those headhunters are going to attack all of you and kill you. Just before dawn, and David Livingston said, I thought this is probably the end. But he said, we, true story. But he said, we prayed. And he said, the sun rose the next morning and we were still alive. And he said, a year later, I found out that that tribe came to faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, I saw the chief and I said, were you planning to attack and kill us that night? He said, yes, I was. And David Livingston said, well, true story, why didn't you do it? He said, well, we came to do it. But when we came to do it, surrounding you were 47 warriors with a sword in one hand and a light in the other hand. A sword in one hand and a light in the other hand. And we knew we were no match for those 47 soldiers. David Livingston said three years passed and I was doing a service. I was doing a service in Scotland. And he said, I told that story. And after I told that story, a man in the back said, Preacher Livingston, can I speak to you? I head up the men's ministry here in this church. And he said, I want you to know, we meet every week a group of men and study the Bible. But he said, what date? What date was that? He pulled out his journal that that happened. 
He said, January the 14th, 1856. That man said, look here in my journal. January the 14th, 1856. We met here for Bible study. And God placed on my heart. Tonight, men, we don't need to study the Bible. Tonight, God, I believe, has directed me. We just need to get in an altar. And we need to spend some time praying for the protection of David Livingston. He said on that night, 47 of us got in the altar and prayed for the protection of David Livingston. I say something to you, God is looking. He's looking at what you're going through and he cares about what you're going through. But not only God is looking, God is listening. And praise be to God, God is leading and God is working.